connective tissue is for support, transport, okay, and also for connection of tissues to each other, okay? Binding of other tissues together. So you could think of it almost like glue. Okay. Muscle tissue turns chemical potential energy into the energy of movement, which is kinetic energy. And nerve tissue, of course, is to send and receive electrical signals. The incoming signals from the body to the central nervous system are called stimuli. Okay. And the outgoing signals are commands. Okay. And when we learn more about the nervous system, you'll find that the stimuli are part of what we call the afferent division, meaning going in. And the commands are part of the efferent division, E for exit, E for efferent, E meaning going out, okay? And every cell in each one of these tissues is gonna have features that reflect the job that it does. We talked about the fact that when you see a feature anywhere in a living system, it's not decorative, right? It has a purpose. So there you can see some of the different tissue types, right? Nervous tissue gonna be found where? brain, spinal cord, peripheral nerves, right? Muscle tissue, three types, right? Skeletal muscle is attached to bone or to other skeletal muscle, right? Smooth muscle is found in the walls of hollow organs and the lining of blood vessels and the iris of your eye and attached to every hair in your body, okay? And cardiac muscle is found one place, which is in the heart, okay? Epithelial tissue, right? You can see yeah. forming boundaries between different environments, protecting, secreting, absorbing, filtering, right? Lining the digestive tract, covering the surface of your skin, lining your mucous membranes, okay? All epithelial tissue, okay? And then connective tissue, which is the broadest type, really falls into three categories, right? There's liquid connective tissue, there's connective tissue proper, and there's structural connective tissue. Okay, and there's structural connective tissue. We have bone and cartilage. Okay, under connective tissue proper, we have dense, regular, dense, irregular. Loose, adipose, and reticular. Okay. Now, the liquid connective tissue, you got two, which is blood and lymph. So you can see it's a huge category, right? And every connective tissue, regardless of the category, is gonna be characterized by the cells being spaced pretty far apart. And there are a lot of material between the cells. And that material could be a solid, a liquid, a semi-solid, okay? And the extracellular matrix often defines what the connective tissue does in most cases, okay? Whereas in epithelial and muscle tissue, there's not much extracellular matrix. It's a little bit, but not terribly much. And nervous tissue is special. Nervous tissue has two populations of cells called neurons, which do the electrical work, and glial cells, which aid the neurons in their function because they're so busy with the electrical work. And it's the glial cells really that form the matrix for nervous tissue, okay? 
when we study tissue, we got to fix it first so it doesn't rot, right? Then we got to cut thin sections so that light will pass through it. And we got to stain it so we can see stuff, right? So there's going to be stains that cling to the nucleus. There's going to be stains that cling to some of the proteins. In some cases, you can use special stains that light up special structures, okay? Um, and then we can observe it under the scope, right? And look at the different features under the light microscope. And we've got tissue sections in the lab that we looked at a few of them last week, okay? We looked, I think, at the, I think it was spleen or something. Might have been spleen, might have been liver. I can't remember off the top of my head. But it was a spleen. Saw, it was a spleen. But you saw, <laughs> yeah, you saw different features as we got to higher and higher magnifications. And that reflects the fact that there's different cell types in there, right? And that also reflects the fact that what we actually looked at was not so much a tissue as an organ, right? An organ is one level up from a tissue. An organ is multiple tissues doing something that a single tissue can't, right? So epithelial tissue forms boundaries. The types by location are covering and lining epithelia, which are on external and internal surfaces, and they provide what? Barrier function. This is one of our protections against infection, right? So barrier function is physical, biological, and biochemical barriers to penetration by pathogens, right? We could take your skin, for example. We'll learn more about your skin in chapter five, but um, your, the upper layer of your skin is constantly shed, right? Everywhere you walk, you leave a skin cell trail, right? 99% of dust is human skin. So think about that the next time you dust your house, okay? Um, that's, in, that's an important function because that keeps infection from setting up. By constantly shedding those upper layers, you don't give pathogenic bacteria time to colonize and set up camp and possibly get into the deeper tissues, right? In addition to that, um, there are glands in the skin that are epithelial in nature that secrete things like sweat and oil, and that flushes the skin of pathogens. And it also has in it stuff that retards microbial growth. And that also cuts down on infection, okay? Your mucous membranes are another barrier, right? These are the uh, linings of things like your oral cavity, your throat, your rectum and anus, your vagina, your urethra, okay? And your upper respiratory, just to name a few. And they're lined by tissue that secretes mucus and cells that can move that mucus from one place to another, generally up towards the oral cavity uh, or out of the body through an orifice uh, where it ends up not being in the deeper tissues and causing trouble, right? The mucus has a flushing action and a trapping action, right? And of course, the epithelial cells form a barrier, okay? So if you didn't have these, you would have terrible problems with infection, right? Uh, if you go to a, a burn clinic, one of the things that they deal with is massive infection because they lack the barrier function of the skin because it's been burned away, okay? Glandular epithelia is different, okay? Glandular epithelia are in things like endocrine and exocrine glands. Okay, and what they do is they secrete. They secrete materials into another space, okay? An endocrine gland secretes material directly into the bloodstream through active transport. An exocrine gland secretes material directly into a duct, a pipe that leads to a surface or to the interior of a hollow organ, okay? So that's secretory epithelia, right? So you got barrier function, you got secretory function, and you've got the flip side, which is absorptive function right? Where would absorption happen? Well, places like the kidneys and the digestive system. In the digestive system, we have to absorb nutrients from the alimentary canal, 
right? The tract that runs from your mouth to your anus into the bloodstream, right? In order to do that, we need cells that are capable of picking up what we need and leaving out what we don't, right? And then moving that material ultimately into the blood or in the case of our, our dietary fat into the lymph, okay? And it also happens in the kidneys where we have to reabsorb a lot of the water that ends up in the kidney tubules along with a lot of the electrolytes. And so the cells there reflect that job because they have a lot of surface area on them. They have little extensions called microvilli that jack up their surface area, okay? So that's absorption and secretion, okay? Uh, protection, we've kind of addressed, right? The cells that protect in our outer barriers and our inner barriers are tightly sealed to each other so that material can't pass between them, okay? And the protective epithelial tissue tends to be stratified, okay? Which means that there's many layers of the same cell type. And why is that? Because that's tougher stuff, right? It's tougher to get through many layers than one layer, a single layer of tissue, such as you'd find in absorption and filtration and excretion, okay, tend to be simple tissues, meaning one layer. Okay. Simple tissues. Okay. And then there is some role for sensory reception in epithelial tissue. Primarily, we're talking here about things like hair follicles, right? Which are attached to hair shafts and there are usually nerve endings wrapped around those hair follicles. And there's also nerve endings in the skin that provide sensation as well as in the mucous membranes and in even the simple epithelium, okay? Most of the sensory receptive information that we get that we're aware of is gonna come from uh, what we call proprioreception, which are receptors that are in muscles and joints and somatic sensation, which is on the surface of the skin, okay? But even at that, we only get a fraction of that information. And then the other information that's coming from our internal organs over 99% of that never makes it to our consciousness. It gets filtered out and it gets dealt with by what we call the autonomic nervous system, okay? So even though we're not aware of it, we still act on it, okay? So different functions, right? Epithelial tissues have polarity, meaning what? There are ends to the tissues, right? There's a basal end and an apical end. The basal end usually sits on a surface of extracellular matrix, and the apical end is facing the free surface. Okay. In stratified tissues, um, the basal end and the apical end um, might be resting on other cells. Okay. Specialized contacts, these will be junctions. Okay, cell-cell junctions, we'll learn about those. We already talked about tight junctions and adhesion, adherence junctions and desmosomes and hemidesmosomes. Those are some examples of these contacts. They're supported by connective tissue. They generally overlie areolar connective tissue, okay? Most of the time, okay? So loose connective tissue, beneath, which makes sense because that's acting like glue, okay? They're avascular, meaning no blood vessels, but they're innervated, meaning they have nerve endings, okay? So no blood vessels, comma, but nerve endings are present. Okay. And they can regenerate, right? 
Now, there's a caveat to that. They can regenerate as long, whoops, sorry. Erase that, stop it. As long as the stem cell layer is intact. Okay. If you destroy that layer, then you're not going to replace the epithelial tissue instead, what you're gonna get is something called scar tissue, which is a type of connective tissue, okay? And you've probably seen this on yourself. Everybody has scar somewhere, surgical scar, accident scar somewhere. If you look at that scar, one of the things that you'll notice is that it's different from the surrounding skin, right? It lacks hair follicles, it lacks hair shafts, it lacks sweat glands and oil glands, right? It's just a patch to cover the hole. And that reflects the fact that in the area where that injury was, was received, you destroyed the stem cell layer. In the case of the skin, you destroyed a layer of the skin called the stratum basale, which is the deepest layer of the epidermis, okay? So the apical surface, we talked about the fact that that's exposed to the, to the free space, right? The surface of something or the hollow opening of something, right? Where the basal surface is attached, usually to extracellular matrix. And the ends are often different in structure and function, meaning they'll have different membrane proteins embedded in them, right? Maybe different pumps on the apical surface versus the basal surface, okay? So you're doing different tricks on one side than the other. They may be smooth and slick, right? A lot of them have microvilli, which are the brush borders that you see in intestinal lining, which can increase surface area. And some have cilia, such as the epithelia that line the upper respiratory tract and line the seminiferous tubules in males, which are where sperm get made, and line the oviducts in females, which transport the eggs in the ovary towards the uterus, right? It's the beating of the cilia that create a current that help the egg to make it to the uterus so that it can implant in another epithelial lining called the endometrium. Okay. In the case of the upper respiratory, the cilia help to move particulate mucus up towards the oral cavity. So you can either spit it out or swallow it. In either case, it doesn't end up in your lungs where it would damage the delicate simple squamous epithelia, which is a single layer of flattened cells. Okay. The basal lamina is a glycoprotein and collagen extracellular matrix that forms an adhesive sheet and can have a filter function and provides material for cell migration during wound repair. So that crawls along molecules that are on the surface kind of like a rock climber will climb along a, a vertical face looking for bumps or crags, okay? Covering and lining epithelial tissues fit closely together and form sheets, and that's to prevent penetration. An example would be the stratified squamous epithelium of your skin, right? It does not allow water to soak through it and get into your deeper tissues, right? If it did, then every time you took a shower, or stood out in the rain, you would change your electrolyte balance and that would mess with your cell function, okay? Because that would screw up membrane potential. Instead, your skin acts like a wetsuit and locks the moisture out. And so the only way water gets in you is if you drink it or you eat it, right? Other contacts that bind cells include tight junctions and desmosomes. The tight junctions don't permit material to go between cells. The desmosomes can permit some material to go between. All of these are supported by connective tissue. 
And by connective tissue, we mean connective tissue proper. Okay. And generally we're talking here about loose connective tissue. Okay. Loose connective tissue is sometimes called areolar. The reticular lamina is deep to the basal lamina. It's a connective tissue product. It has a lot of collagen in it. The basement membrane is the basal lamina and reticular lamina together. It reinforces the epithelium so that it resists stretching and tearing, and it defines where the epithelium begins, okay? So your skin is an organ, really, because when we study your skin in chapter five, you're gonna find out that the top layer is epithelia, and then under that is loose connective tissue, and under that is actually something called dense irregular connective tissue. And then throughout the connective tissue is a blood supply and a nerve supply and immune cells, okay? And so that's for sure an organ, right? Because what you have there is a combination of different tissues doing something as a team that a single tissue could not. There's no blood vessels in epithelial tissue, it's avascular. And so it's nourished by diffusion. So what happens there is that the oxygen and the nutrients in the blood supply are gonna move down their concentration gradients from the blood into the tissues. And that's how the tissues pick up their goodies. That's how they get their nutrients, their building blocks, and that's how they get the oxygen they need to make enough ATP to survive. Now in stratified tissues, what happens is that the further those cells get away from the blood supply, the less likely they are to survive. And what will happen is that they will die and be shed, okay? That happens particularly in what we call keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, where a special layer called the stratum granulosum forms a diffusion barrier and chokes off oxygen and nutrients from cells above it. And so everything above the granulosum is officially dead. There's also nerve fibers here, okay, that can detect things like vibration and fine touch, okay? And then usually in the connective tissue, there are nerve endings that can pick up things like deep pressure. And they're all modified so that they only respond to those stimuli. Epithelial tissue generates, regenerates quickly because it's frequently shed, and that's by design, right? As quickly as the cells get shed from the top, we make more that come up from the bottom and the cycle continues, right? It's stimulated by loss of the apical basal polarity and lateral contacts. Some are exposed to friction and some are exposed to hostile substances. If adequate nutrients can replace the lost cells by its cell division, then we keep regenerating those layers, right? So these guys, take a licking and keep on ticking, right? They get, they get beat to hell and back, but they keep getting regenerated, okay? And that's what we want, right? And remember when I told you guys that form follows function, the, the tissue that you'll find lining the different parts of the body is gonna be um, reflective of its job, right? So you've got stratified epithelia in the mucous membranes and in the covering of the skin, Right? And you have simple epithelia lining things like the digestive tract from the stomach on through the end of the colon and simple epithelia in um, places like the kidney tubules. Okay? Epithelial tissue is named by its layering and its shape. Okay? If it's one layer of similar cells, it's called simple. And if it's multiple layers, it's called stratified, okay? So right away, you're gonna see a difference in structural integrity, right? The simple tissues are delicate and easily damaged. The stratified tissues, not so much, okay? The three types of shapes are squamous, which is flat, like a pancake, okay? The aboidal, which is shaped like a box, and then columnar, which is shaped like a post. Okay. 
The stratified epithelia, they're classed by their cell shape of the apical layer, the topmost layer, right? So you might see stratified squamous epithelia, but in the deeper layers, it'll look cuboidal, but you go by what's on the top, okay? So you can see some examples, right? See the basal and the apical surface of a simple epithelial tissue on the top and a stratified tissue on the bottom, okay? The layers down here would be regenerative. Okay, these would be stem cells. Okay, layers up here are mature. Hmm. And in some tissues, even dead. Okay. Squamous cells are flattened, often hexagonal, right? With a flattened nucleus. Cuboidal cells look like a box with a round nucleus and columnar cells like a post with an elongated nucleus. Pretty straightforward. And there's the different shapes, okay? Different shapes for different jobs, right? Generally, cuboidal and columnar tissues are simple, okay? And squamous tissues can either be simple or stratified. All right. That's not for everything. That's just a general rule. Okay. Simple epithelia, delicate tissues for absorption, secretion, filtration. They're easily damaged, right? Which makes sense because it's just one layer. Okay. And so we try to protect it as much as we can. In simple squamous epithelia, the cells are flattened laterally. The cytoplasm is sparse. They function where rapid diffusion is a priority, such as in the kidney and the lungs. You can see here some examples, right? Here is simple squamous epithelia from lung. And what you're doing is you're looking at it edge on, okay? So think of a stack of pancakes, except You've only got one pancake in the stack and you're looking at it from the side, okay? And so you can see nuclei. Let's get the uh, laser pointer out. You can see nuclei here and here and here and here, right? They stay blue, right? And the rest of these are cells lying edge to edge. And then these are just spaces that are filled with gas, okay? This is from lung tissue. Um, these structures are called alveoli. Okay. Other places you'd find simple squamous epithelia would be in the kidney tubules. Okay. And in lymphatic vessels. All right. And lining uh, the inner lining of blood vessels. Okay. You place no, no blood vessels are going through the tissue, but there are going to be blood vessels nearby. Okay. Other places, endothelium, right? The lining of lymphatic and blood vessels and the lining of the heart. And mesothelium, which is the epithelium of serous membranes in the ventral body cavity, okay? Now, this is a chapter that hopefully you watched the podcast. I sent you guys the link for chapter one so that you can go and review that. There's also a lecture link, I believe, in the, in the Blackboard course um, by the lead instructor. But remember that the ventral body cavity has in the thoracic cavity, the two pleural cavities that contain the lung, the pericardial cavity containing the heart and the space between the pleural cavities called the mediastinum. And then below the diaphragm, you have the abdominal pelvic cavity, which is lined by something called the peritoneum, all right? And the peritoneum in many cases will enclose abdominal pelvic organs and all of these membranes produce a serous fluid, which has a lubricating effect so that organ movement doesn't produce irritation, inflammation, and scarring, right? And so that's what we're talking about here with mesothelia, okay? Anything, any organ that moves, which is most of your organs, is gonna produce potentially friction, right? And so it needs a lube job so it doesn't wear out, right? 
Simple cuboidal epithelium, single layer of cells designed for secretion and absorption. Forms walls and the smallest ducts of glands and a lot of kidney tubules. Okay. And you can see it here, right? This is a cross section of kidney. And you can see, let me get green here, color. You can see, right, that's a single layer, right? The space in the middle is called the lumen, right? And then between these tubules, you're taking a cross section here, are other kidney cells that are not part of the simple cuboidal, right? And these cells may be uh, blood vessels, right? And they may be, in some cases, connective tissue, right? So simple epithelium, right? Because one of the things that the kidney has to do is to filter your blood and then take that filtrate and then pitch what's waste products and hold on to what's useful, which is water and other solutes. In order to do that, you need a simple epithelia that has the ability to be selectively permeable. And that's what these simple cuboidal cells in part can do. Simple columnar epithelium is a single layer of tall, closely packed cells that act in absorption and secretion, right? And if we look here, we can see a section from small intestine, okay? Your small intestine is the part of the alimentary canal, the digestive tract, that does most of the nutrient absorption, right? When you eat your food, your digestive system mechanically and chemically breaks down your fats and your proteins and your complex carbohydrates into amino acids and simple sugars and triglycerides, right? The amino acids and the simple sugars pass through the epithelial lining of the small intestine into blood vessels that go to the liver. And the fats, triglycerides, pass through those cells and go into the lymphatic system, okay? Note that on the apical end, you have microvilli. See the microvilli right there, okay? Those are little, they look like little tiny hairs. They call it a brush border, right? And that increases the surface area for absorption and secretion. And then you'll occasionally find these guys, these are goblet cells and they make mucus. And the mucus is there to lubricate the tract and to trap particulates and pathogens and to act as a flushing agent, right? And it also eases the food from one end of the tract to the other. So it both protects the tract and it lets the food move through it more easily. So it's a lubricator and a protector. Okay. Pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. That's a mouthful. <laughs> means, let's break the word down. Remember your med terminology, right? So we break the word down. Pseudo means fake, right? So fake. Okay. Stratified means layered. Okay. Columnar means post shaped. Right. And epithelium refers to, that should be a U, by the way. Um to the tissue, right? So the cells, it's actually a simple epithelium, but some of the cells are short and some of them are tall. And the tall cells lean over the short ones and make it look as if it's stratified, but it actually isn't. And its purpose is for secretion and absorption, right? The cilia are there to move the mucus one way or the other. Okay, in the upper respiratory, it moves the mucus towards the oral cavity, right? In the uh, oviducts, it, it moves fluid towards the uterus, okay? And in seminiferous tubules, it moves fluid and sperm towards the epididymis, where the sperm mature and learn how to swim, okay? So you can see ATP is going to be the power source for this because it's moving material. Um, in a way that requires effort because you're working against gravity in many cases, right? 
But this is actually a simple epithelia, right? Even though this nucleus is way up here and this one's way down here and this one's way up here, it's one layer, right? They're all in contact with the basal layer down here. And so it is a simple epithelium. Okay. In smokers, the carbon monoxide paralyzes the cilia and the particulate mucus falls down into the lungs and damages the delicate simple squamous epithelium. And that's a hallmark of a disease known as emphysema. Okay. Stratified epithelial tissues are two or more layers. They regenerate from what's called the basal or the stem cell layer, and the cells migrate to the surface. And it's a more durable tissue because it's got more layers to it. And its major job is to protect, okay? So this is, these tissues are gonna be found in places that take a beating, okay? And if you think about all the places you find them, those are places that take a beating. The rectum, the anus, the vagina, the oral cavity, the pharynx or throat, right? They all experience trauma of one kind or another, okay? And so you don't want those tissues to tear, right? Because if they tear, rupture, then you've got a potential for infection. Stratified squamous epithelia is the most widespread. The free surface is squamous and the deeper layers can be cuboidal or columnar, and it's designed to resist trauma, right? Those farthest from the basal layer are less viable because diffusion only goes a limited distance, okay? So here's an example of non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Notice multiple layers of flattened cells overlying a basal layer that's more cuboidal and is in contact with the blood supply intimately which means that it's got access to nutrients and oxygen, and that's why it can keep dividing. But the upper layers can eventually be shed and regenerated from below, right? Frequently, it's a very smooth surfaced tissue, smooth and moist, and that again is for lubrication. So you would find this where? In the oral cavity, in the throat, in the rectum, in the anus, okay? In the vagina, all right? The keratinized type is found where? It's gonna be on the surface of your skin, right? Stratified cuboidal is found in sweat and mammary glands, a couple of cell layers thick, okay? And its main job is secretion. Stratified columnar is found in the throat, the male urethra, and in some glandular ducts, and in areas between different epithelia, and only the apical layer is columnar here. This one is a pretty important one. This is transitional epithelium. And you find this lining the ureters and the bladder. And the reason is that these are tissues that have to stretch and snap back. So transitional indicates its ability to transition between different shapes. So it can transition from cuboidal when it isn't stretched to squamous when it is stretched, okay? It is a stratified tissue, so it's tough, okay? And you could see an example of, of non-stretched transitional here, okay? Notice it looks like stratified cuboidal, but when we stretch it out, what happens is that those layers flatten, okay? So in the bladder, when it fills with urine, those layers would flatten, okay? And again, why? because you're talking about organs that have to stretch out and snap back, right? I'm very happy that my bladder can stretch and then retract. Right. Okay. Well, I know. If it couldn't, what would happen? You'd be peeing all the time. Well, right? first. Yep. Glandular epithelia is different, okay? Glandular epithelia secretes, okay? And it either is going to be secreting into a duct, which is typical of what we call an exocrine gland, or it can be secreting directly into the bloodstream, which is typical of an endocrine gland, okay? There are some organs that have both types of tissues in them at the same time, such as the pancreas, okay? So they're classified by what they release, either an endocrine or an exocrine product, and by the number of cells that form the gland, right? Some glands have one cell, such as a goblet cell, and some are multicellular. Endocrine glands, are gonna secrete into the bloodstream, usually by exocytosis, 
hormones that travel through lymph or blood to their specific targets, cause those targets to respond. And those targets will have receptors for those particular secretions, okay? An exocrine gland is gonna secrete into a pipe and that pipe will lead to a hollow cavity or onto a free surface. Examples include mucus glands, sweat, oil, and salivary glands, right? So we make it, we spit it into the pipe and the pipe leads to a destination. Okay. Unicellular exocrine glands would be things like goblet cells down in the epithelial lining of the intestine and the respiratory tract, making mucin, which dissolves in water to make mucus, which is the protective lubricant that allows material to move through the pipe and that can trap pathogens and particulates. So you can see examples of these glands here. That's a goblet cell, right? See all the secretory vesicles ready to exocytose on the top. And then you've got Golgi underneath, right? Kicking that stuff out. And then of course, you're gonna have tons and tons of ribosomes, right? That manufacture the stuff that's in the vesicles. And you send it a protein, right? So up we go and out we go, right? There are different types of secretion, okay? Holocrine, neurocrine, uh, apocrine, okay? Different forms of secretion. Okay, in holocrine, the whole cell becomes a secretion. In apocrine, the top of the cell pinches off and becomes a secretion. And in merocrine, you're doing what the goblet cell is doing. You're just spitting it out through active transport. Okay. Multicellular exocrine glands are composed of a duct and a secretory unit surrounded by connective tissue, which supplies blood and nerve fibers and extends into and divides the gland into different lobes, right? And they can be classed according to their structure and the number of branches that they have, right? Simple glands have an unbranched duct, and compound glands have a branched, and the cells can be tubular, alveolar, or tubular alveolar, right? And there's our different secretion types, right? Merocrine by exocytosis, holocrine, the products accumulate and the cell ruptures and becomes a secretion. And apocrine, the products accumulate in the top of the cell and it pinches off and becomes the secretion. And so you can see what the different glands look like and where they're found. Okay. So those are glands, right? They have there's different tissues doing the job that one tissue cannot, right? You've got connective tissue there, and you've also got epithelial tissue, okay? So it's an organ. Right? There's your merocrine glands, right? And your holocrine glands, and then they don't show apocrine, right? So different glands doing different things, okay? So let's take 10 and we'll come back and get the second part of this. See you guys in 10 minutes. All right.
Okay, y'all. Back. Now, the next tissue type we're going to be dealing with is connective tissue. And we've talked about the fact that it's the broadest of the tissue classes because it has really three subgroups, right? And they're listed here, right? Connective tissue proper, and then cartilage and bone, which are usually grouped as structural connective tissue, and then blood, and I, I include lymph as a liquid connective tissue as well. So let's put lymph in. Okay, so these are liquid connective tissue. And then these are structural connective tissue. Okay, so the hallmark of all connective tissues is cells spaced widely apart with lots of extracellular matrix, okay? Which is really the opposite of epithelial tissue where the cells are pressed tightly together and there's almost no extracellular matrix. So you can see up here with connective tissue proper, right? You have the following, right? You've got areolar, adipose, and reticular connective tissue, which are all classified as loose. Okay. And then dense connective tissue, which can be regular, irregular, and more elastic. The job of all of these is to attach something to something else, all right? Cells that you'll find in all loose connective tissues, you'll find fibroblasts and fibrocytes, which are mature fibroblasts. In loose connective tissue, you're gonna find white blood cells, okay? And in adipose connective tissue, you'll find adipocytes, which are fat cells. Okay? In dense connective tissue, you'll find fibroblasts and fibrocytes. You won't find adipocytes, and you'll find limited numbers of defense cells, if any. Okay. In cartilage, a structural connective tissue, you find extensive extracellular matrix and chondroblasts and chondrocytes. Right? The chondroblasts are the immature cartilage cells, and the chondrocytes are the mature ones. Okay. And the purpose of cartilage is to serve as beginning material for the production of bone. And it also serves in some places in the body as structural components, such as in the upper respiratory, right? And in other places, it can form flaps or valves, okay? And in other places, it can attach bone to bone. Okay, so it all depends on what cartilage we're talking about and where we find it. Okay. It can resist compression because it's got a lot of water in it and it can cushion and pad other surfaces. Okay. Your entire skeletal system pretty much starts out as cartilage and is replaced slowly by bone, first in utero and then eventually uh, as an infant, and finally as an adult, right? You can see bone here, another structural connective tissue. The extracellular matrix in bone, instead of being the, uh, the semi-solid that it is in cartilage, is actually um, mostly protein and calcium phosphate. So it's pretty tough stuff, but it resists both compression and twisting. So it's a little bit like uh, a cement foundation or a sidewalk in that regard. Okay. Um, a lot of collagen fibers throughout, 
okay? And a lot of calcium salts and it functions in support. And then blood and lymph are transport liquid connective tissues, right? The purpose of blood is to transport nutrients and oxygen, and waste products and hormones and immune components, right? And the purpose of lymph is to transport interstitial fluid and pathogens and cancer cells to places where they'll be filtered out and destroyed, lymph nodes, for instance, and then to move that filtered liquid back into the blood at the subclavian veins, which run right under each clavicle, okay? But note that in every connective tissue, the cells are spread way out and there's extensive extracellular matrix. So it's for binding and support, for protection, for insulation, for storing fuel, that would be adipose tissue, and for transport, okay? Three characteristics that make connective tissue different from other tissues. They have mesenchyme as their common tissue of origin, which comes from a, an, an embryonic germline called mesoderm. Okay. There are three germline cells that form when you're an embryonic disc. There's a point in your development where you look like a Frisbee, okay? And you have this little groove running right down the middle of you, which is eventually going to be your, your vertebral column and your, your spinal cord, but it isn't yet. Your head would be up here. This would be your tail, right? And then within this disc, you've got three layers of cells along the surface is called ectoderm. The one that's going to line your body cavities is called endoderm. And then the one that forms most of the rest of your body is mesoderm. Okay, so this comes from mesoderm here. It's going to have varying degrees of vascularity. Okay, some are going to be virtually avascular, and some are going to be extensively vascularized. And they have lots of extracellular matrix, ECM for short. Okay. Three elements in connective tissue are ground substance, fibers, and cells, the composition of which is gonna be different in different connective tissues. Ground substance is material that fills the space between the cells. It's a medium through which solutes can diffuse between blood capillaries and cells so that they can get nourishment, right? Components include interstitial fluid, and then cell adhesion proteins and proteoglycans, which are made up of a protein plus a sugar component, okay? Chondroitin sulfate and hyaluronic acid are examples. They have a, a, a tremendous negative charge, which means that they can trap lots of water and that affects the viscosity of ground substance. Viscosity is just the resistance to flow in a liquid. The more water you take on, the less viscosity you have, okay? The different types of fibers include collagen, which provides tensile strength, elastin, that allows for stretch and snap back, and reticular fibers, which form um, really a scaffolding upon which other cells can sit, right? The blast cells are the immature forms of the cells that eventually become sites, right? Fibroblasts become fibrocytes, chondroblasts become chondrocytes, and osteoblasts become osteocytes, right? And then there's usually um, in bone what we call a medullary cavity, right? And in the axial skeleton, which is the skull, the vertebral column, the rib cage, the sternum, and the pectoral and pelvic girdle, you have red marrow, and that's where hematopoietic stem cells live, and they make all of the components of blood, the cellular components, so the white blood cells, the red blood cells, and the platelets. The cells that are in the site form maintain the matrix, 
right? While the cells that are in the blast form secrete it, right? Other cell types, fat cells, I'll call them adipocytes. They're gonna store nutrients, like blood cells, which are leukocytes. Include neutrophils, eosinophils, lymphocytes, macrophages, monocytes, okay? Are there for immunity, right? Mast cells, which are a type of basophil, which is a type of leukocyte. All these fixed basophils. are gonna promote inflammation because of the release of histamine. Okay. And then macrophages eat dead cells and microorganisms and aid in immunity by warning the lymphocytes that you have an infection by displaying pieces of the pathogen on their surface. So you can see here, different components, right? Mass cells, fat cells, right? This would be connective tissue proper. Okay. All connective tissues except for bone, cartilage, and blood, all right? have these following subclasses, okay? Loose connective tissue, which we've discussed, right? And then dense connective tissue, which is coming up in a bit, okay? So the different types. Areolar connective tissue is found usually under epithelial layers. It's a reservoir for water and salt, but it's also a defense against infection because it contains Leukocytes. Okay. It's stored nutrients as fat and adipocytes. Okay. Fibroblasts secrete matrix. Fibers are usually loosely arranged to allow movement of immune cells. Okay. Ground substance we've discussed, right? It's got the negative charge, holds water. And when it gets inflamed, it can swell up. That's edema. So there's areolar connective tissue. All right, see the fibers running through? Okay. Notice where it is, right? Right underneath epithelial tissues, okay? And so these white blood cells can move through this relatively easily and pick off pathogens before they try to get into the blood supply, right? So that's an excellent design. Adipose tissue contains adipocytes, very little matrix, lots of blood vessels. Its purpose, padding, insulation, protection, energy storage. Brown fat is a little different because it uses the lipid in it to produce heat um, instead of producing ATP. It can be found in places like between the scapula and young children, okay? It's also found in bears that's how they're able to generate body heat when they hibernate during the winter. Okay? Uh, the reason the brown fat can do that is because it has an uncoupled electron transport chain, meaning the electron transport chain will, will take, you know, suck the energy out of the electrons that it's transporting, but it won't produce ATP because it doesn't have the, uh, the synthase, right? So what's happening is it's just it's just pumping protons into one place and then they're moving into the other place and that's generating heat. Okay. There's what white adipose tissue looks like. Okay. 
the adipocyte is actually squished into one side of the cell, and this is just a big lipid droplet. It's all filled with lipid here. Lots of blood vessels running through it. Reticular connective tissue is generally found in lymphatic organs, such as the spleen and the lymph nodes. Okay, um, can also be found in bone marrow. What you have there are fibroblasts that generate the scaffolding, the reticulum, right? And then you have immune cells that are scattered among that. So you can see the reticular fibers and you can see the leukocytes there, okay? In the spleen, which is what this is from, blood percolates through the organ and the white blood cells help to recycle the red blood cells that are broken down and also to remove pathogens and cancer cells that might be in the blood, okay? And then we can recycle components of the red blood cells. We hold on to the iron and the amino acids, and then we generally pitch the heme. Dense regular connective tissue is for ligaments and tendons, okay? It's got a lot of collagen in it that run parallel to each other. They resist pulling stress, but it's poorly vascularized. And so it takes a long time to heal. Anybody that's ever ruptured a tendon knows this, it takes a long time to heal. And if you rupture a ligament, which has even poorer blood supply, you generally have to surgically repair it. Right? It's not, it's not going to grow back, unfortunately. Right? You can see what it looks like here, right? Connective tissue proper. It looks a little bit like we're going to see a little bit later skeletal muscle, but the difference is it doesn't have striations running through it, which would be vertical light and dark bands that reflect the regular arrangement of the actin and the myosin in skeletal muscle. Right, so you don't see that here. Okay, you can see the nuclei of the fibroblasts, the collagen fibers, and so on. Okay, dense irregular connective tissue is the same components as dense regular, but they're irregularly arranged, and so it can resist stress in many different directions. So we find this in joint capsules and in the dermis, particularly in what we call the reticular dermis. Dermis, which is under the papillary dermis. Which is found primarily, which is made primarily of loose connective tissue. So in skin, it goes stratified squamous epithelia, then loose connective tissue going deeper and then reticular uh, dermis, which is dense irregular connective tissue. Okay. So you can see here, same basic components, but resists stress in multiple directions, right? The collagen, again, is very tough stuff. Okay. Elastic connective tissue can be found in some ligaments, but primarily in the connective tissue lining of large arteries, such as in the aorta, okay, which has to stretch and snap back. An example here from aorta shows elastic fibers running throughout the tissue so that it can stretch and recoil, okay? Noting again that the lining of the lumen is gonna be endothelium, right? So you've got endothelium, you've got connective tissue, and then you've got another layer of connective tissue outside the elastic layer, and then you'll have blood vessels running through the walls of these larger vessels called vasovasorum, right? So again, you have an organ here. You'll also have nerve endings in this. Okay. Cartilage is a structural connective tissue. Okay made up of chondroblasts that become chondrocytes, 
no nerve fibers. 80% of this is water, so it can rebound after it compresses, and it's avascular, so it relies on diffusion. for nutrients and oxygen, okay? Which means it's not very thick because diffusion doesn't go very far, okay? There's a membrane that surrounds a lot of cartilage in the body called the perichondrium, which has blood vessels in it, and then the material diffuses from those blood vessels into the cartilage, okay? There are some areas where the cartilage doesn't have a perichondria, okay? And instead is surrounded by um, synovial fluid, such as in the cartilage that's in the end of joints, right? In that case, the, the oxygen in the nutrients has to diffuse through the synovial fluid into the cartilage. Different types of cartilage include hyaline, elastic, and fiber cartilage, which vary according to the number of fibers you find in the extracellular matrix. So in hyaline cartilage, you have few, if any, visible fibers. The cells exist in little chambers that are called lacunae, okay, which is um, Italian for little lake, right? And because they're trapped in their own matrix, they're, they're kind of in a pickle, right? Which is, how do we get our goodies? And they get their goodies by diffusion, okay? And so you're not real thick when that's the case, okay? And if anything cuts off their um, diffusible blood supply, right, the, the diffusible goodies from the blood, then the cartilage will die. And that actually happens when we form bone from a cartilage model in a process known as endochondral ossification that we'll learn about when we get to bone, okay? So you can see areas where it's found. It's actually the, uh, the foundational material for most of the skeletal system and then gets replaced by bone first um, during, uh, during fetal development. And then that usually ends at the end of adolescence when structures called the epiphyseal plates disappear. That's the last of the, uh, of the cartilage that signifies lengthwise bone growth. And then the only remaining cartilage after that is the cartilage at the end of the bones okay, in the skeletal system. Elastic cartilage has elastic fibers running through it, okay, found in places like the external ear and the uh, epiglottis. Okay. And then fiber cartilage is tough stuff indeed. The intervertebral discs have an outer layer of fiber cartilage that resists compression and shock, right? We also find this in the, uh, in the meniscus of the knee, okay? Tough stuff, intervertebral discs and meniscus of the knee, okay? And pubic synthesis. Bone or osseous tissue has an extracellular matrix made up of protein and, um, calcium phosphate and calcium carbonate salts and other minerals, okay? <coughs> it can store fat and it can make blood depending on whether you're talking about the appendicular or the axial skeleton of the adult. More collagen in bone than in cartilage. Calcium salts give it resistance to compression while the collagen gives it resistance to torsional force, twisting force. The osteoblasts make the matrix while the osteocytes maintain it. And structural units called osteons are found in a type of bone called compact bone, okay? So we'll put here compact bone, which is the bone on surfaces. Okay. And there's a lot of blood vessels running through it. So you can see here compact bone. You can see the osteons. Where, where's the osteon? This is the osteon. This whole thing from this peripheral circle down to this structure called the central canal. Okay. And then these little guys are the lacunae where 
the osteocytes have been trapped in their own secretions. Okay. And then these little things running through the matrix are called canaliculi, and they connect adjacent osteocytes to each other so they can exchange nutrients and waste products and oxygen and CO2. And the material between where the lacunae are called lamellae. Okay, so you've got circumferential lamellae, you've got um, concentric lamellae, and you've got interstitial lamellae. Okay, uh, concentric lamellae are those within the osteon that share a center. Circumferential lamellae go all the way around the surface of the bone, and interstitial lamellae are these guys that you see between the osteons. Okay, very very tough stuff. Blood is a liquid connective tissue, just like lymph. It has a fluid matrix called plasma and formed elements called erythrocytes, leukocytes, and thrombocytes, right? That's red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Fibers are soluble proteins that can precipitate during blood clotting, but normally are soluble, okay? And its main job is transport. Transport of what? Oxygen, nutrients, hormones, immune components, waste products, okay? Electrolytes, all of that stuff. Water, okay? So you can see some examples here, right? You've got some white blood cells with, with purple nuclei visible, right? Red blood cells without nuclei and things that look like debris, like that little thing right there. That's a platelet, believe it or not. That's a platelet there, that's a platelet there, and so on. So most of the cells in blood do not have organelles, right? The thrombocytes and the erythrocytes lack nuclei and other organelles, while the white blood cells have everything. Muscle tissue, also highly vascularized and made to do what? Made to turn chemical potential energy into kinetic energy, right? Different types. Skeletal muscle, cardiac, and smooth, right? Skeletal muscle tissue is found attached to bone and is under voluntary control and is striated, striated. Okay. Cardiac muscle tissue, striated and involuntary. Okay. And smooth muscle tissue, non-striated. And involuntary. Okay. So the only one we consciously control is skeletal muscle. So you can see here what skeletal muscle looks like. Remember, I told you it looks a little bit like dense regular connective tissue, but the difference here is you can see these striations right here. Okay. Striations. So very important to understand that that represents. The regular overlap of actin and myosin, which are contractile proteins in the muscle. And when the muscle contracts, the actin and myosin interdigitate or overlap to a greater extent because the myosin can grab the actin and pull on it. And that pulls on um, proteins that are connected to the muscle cell membrane, like dystrophin. And that pulls on connective tissue that's attached to bone and that causes the movement, okay? And ATP, of course, is the power source, right? And calcium turns out to be the trigger inside the muscle cell that starts the ball rolling, okay? The release of calcium from the structure called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. We get more into how muscle does this when we get to the muscle chapter. There's cardiac muscle, also striated, but Unlike skeletal muscle, one nucleus per cell, and it has intercalated discs, which are combinations of gap junctions and Desmond cells. Okay. And that's to let current move easily from one heart muscle cell to the next, and also to hold the heart muscle tissue together 
while it beats, so it doesn't fly apart. Okay? The um, skeletal muscle, on a point that I didn't really address, is multinucleate, right? There's more than one nucleus per skeletal muscle cell. That's unusual, okay? That's a, that's a phenomenon called a syncytia. multinucleate cell. Okay? The reason for the shape is to increase the amount of overlap between actin and myosin so that we can create tremendous force. Okay? The more overlap, the more that the myosin can grip the actin, the more pulling force you have, the more power you make. Okay? So there's your heart muscle. Okay? Again, note the striations. And then here's smooth muscle, okay? Smooth muscle gets its name from the fact that it doesn't have striations, okay? You've got one nucleus per cell and the cells are spindle shaped. They contain actin and myosin, but in a different arrangement. It's a web-like arrangement that is on the uh, cytoplasmic side of the membrane and causes the, the cells to bunch up when they contract. And it's found in the walls of internal organs attached to every hair in your body, the iris of your eye, lining of your blood vessels and your lymphatic vessels, and so on. Okay. Nervous tissue, very different, okay? It's what we find in the central and the peripheral nervous system. So the central nervous system is the uh, brain, the brain stem and the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system are the nerves that lead out from there to the targets in the body, okay? And his job is to send and receive electrical information, right? The information that comes into the central nervous system from the peripheral nerves is called stimuli. It's also part of the afferent division. And the commands that go out from the central nervous system are the efferent division, right? Commands go to the targets and the targets do the job, okay? The neurons do the electrical work, right? And the neuroglia help them out because they're so busy doing electrical work that they don't have time to do a lot of the other functions that normal cells can do. So they need personal assistance and that's what the neuroglia are for. Okay. So you can see some examples here. Notice that in nerve cells, you've got these extensions coming off, right? The short extensions are called dendrites. The long extensions are called axons. The dendrites, are for the incoming electrical signal, and the axon is for the outgoing electrical signal, okay? So you can see some examples of nerve cells here. See these neuron processes coming off, okay? You can see the supporting cells all around, these little dots, right? Those are the nuclei of supporting cells. So the reason for the extensions, right, is to increase surface area, so that we can monitor the environment for chemical signals that produce electrical signals in the cell, and also to increase contact between neurons. Now by contact, I don't mean literally touching, but I mean coming very, very close to each other. Okay, membranes are made up of at least two tissue types. An epithelium that's bound to connective tissue. These are all simple organs, okay? The three types are cutaneous membranes, such as in the skin, okay? Mucous membranes, where? Pharynx. Oral cavity. Rectum, anus, vagina. Okay. And then serous membranes, peritoneum, pericardium, pleural membranes. Okay. 
Skin is a cutaneous membrane. Keratinized stratified squamous epithelium on the surface. Underneath the dermis as an upper layer of areolar connective tissue. And then beneath that, dense irregular connective tissue. And there's a dry membrane, okay? Mucous membrane, again, lining body cavities open to the outside, okay? The GI, the respiratory, the urogenital tracts, okay? Up to a point, okay? Moist membranes are bathed by secretions, or in the case of the urethra, bathed in urine. The epithelial sheet lies over lamina propria, which is connective tissue, and there may be mucus secretion. Okay? So you can see here um, in, the, in the respiratory and the digestive system, right, where you've got mucosa, generally in the upper respiratory and in the conducting division of the respiratory, which goes from the oral cavity all the way down to the terminal bronchioles, right? And then after that point, we actually have a transition to simple epithelia that run from the respiratory bronchioles all the way to the alveoli, okay? In the digestive, we have stratified epithelia from the oral cavity to the end of the esophagus, right? And simple epithelium from the stomach all the way to the end of the colon. And then we go back to stratified epithelium from the rectum to the anus, okay? Serosi are found in the ventral body cavity, a simple squamous epithelium resting on areolar connective tissue. Okay. The parietal serosa line the internal body cavity walls and the visceral cover internal organs. There's usually serous fluid between the layers. These are moist membranes. And as we said, they have a lubricating quality, right? As well as holding the organs in place so they don't twist, buckle, or kink, they produce this fluid that lubricates the organs while they move so that you don't get friction, irritation, and inflammation, right? So you can see some examples here. Generally, it's a double-layered membrane. There is a parietal and a visceral layer. The parietal layer lines the cavity in which the organ sits, and the visceral layer clings to the organ itself, and the fluid is between the two layers, okay? reducing the friction. Now, occasionally tissue gets damaged, trauma, infection, okay? And repair can either happen through regeneration where you grow back tissue that has all the full features of the originally damaged tissue or through fibrosis where you replace the damaged tissue with scar tissue and lose the original function. Inflammation sets the stage. We release inflammatory chemicals we see blood vessels dilate. We see an increase in vessel permeability and we see clotting, right? So you can see here inflammation, right? You get a cut, the cut goes down into the connective tissue, right? Inflammatory chemicals are released and that's going to cause white blood cells in the bloodstream to stick to that area in the blood vessel and then move towards the area of the injury that's called margination and extravasation, and then positive chemotaxis as they move towards the injury. And what they do is they tear up dead tissue and they kill pathogens and they set the stage for wound repair, right? Clotting occurs, the surface dries, a scab will form, okay? The blood clot gets replaced with what's called granulation tissue. Epithelia begins to regrow. Fibroblasts make collagen to bridge the gap. Debris gets eaten up, okay? So you can see here, we're replacing material, all right? You see the area of granulation. See the fibroblasts, right? We're generating epithelium. The macrophages, of course, in there, they, they're the, uh, the eaters, right? Then the scab will detach. Fibrous tissue matures. The epithelium thickens and starts to look like the adjacent tissue, results in fully regenerated epithelium, but with scar tissue underneath, right? So what don't we get back? We don't get back 
uh, glands, hair follicles, hair shafts, okay? So we lose sweat glands, we, use, we lose oil glands, okay? And that's because we've lost some of that basal layer. The deeper purple layers are the living layers that produce the overlying layers, right? So we lose some of that. Different tissues can regenerate to different extents, right? Those that regenerate extremely well usually have what we call a high mitotic index, I meaning they divide a lot, okay? It includes epithelial tissue, bone, aerial or connective tissue, dense, irregular connective tissue, and blood forming tissue, okay? Another characteristic shared by most of these is extensive blood supply, right? Moderate regeneration capacity, smooth muscle, and dense regular connective tissue like ligaments and tendons, at virtually no regenerative capacity, cardiac and skeletal muscle, nervous tissue, okay? Um, and this is of course very confounding, right? Because we would love these tissues to be able to regenerate, okay? Uh, there has been some work at spinal cord regeneration that's been successful, okay? And some very special surgical techniques were used and some very special cell populations were used that I'll get into later in the course, okay? Um, but generally speaking, um, with nervous tissue, you get all you're gonna get. Same with skeletal muscle and with cardiac muscle. So you might wonder, okay, well, when I exercise and my muscles get big, aren't I getting more muscle cells? And the answer is no, you're getting more muscle protein. And so your muscle cells are thickening and that's what makes them bigger and more powerful, okay? Now, the, um, the germ layers that we talked about earlier, the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm are formed during uh, the period of time where we're what's called an embryonic disc, okay? Um, the ectoderm forms epithelial tissue and nervous tissue, okay? The endothelium forms the the, the deeper linings of the respiratory, the digestive, and the reproductive system, and the urinary system, okay? And the mesoderm forms everything else, right? That's the way I like to think of it. And so there's a period of time when you're this Frisbee, okay? So here's our Frisbee, all right? And um, this, this is gonna be your head. Okay, and uh, back here, this is going to be your tail, okay, or the end of your vertebral column, if you like, right? And so the ectoderm is shown in blue. The mesoderm actually migrates through this little groove called the primitive streak and becomes this inner layer of cells. And then the endoderm is going to form these inner linings. So you go from uh, a one layer disc to a two layer disc to a three layer disc, which is shown here. Okay, one layer to two layers to three layers. As tissues age, they break down because the rate of death becomes greater than the rate of regeneration or replacement, okay? Epithelia thin with increasing age, so there's more likelihood of injury and infection, okay? Um, tissue repair is less effective because you just don't have as many cells to, to do the work. Bone and muscle and nervous tissue begins to atrophy, and DNA mutations can lead to increased cancer risk. And we've talked about the fact that one of the reasons this happens is because of the loss of DNA at the telomeres, which are the ends of chromosomes, right? So as you lose that information, you begin to lose critical information. And once you lose critical information, then the, the cells die, the tissues die, the organs die, and then the organism dies, right? So that's at least part of the puzzle of why we age and die. There's obviously more to it than that as um, 
Brooke Greenberg and Syndrome X have shown us, right? Okay, what I wanna do now is show you a little bit about tissues. So let's jump over here. Let's take a listen to this. Again, with epithelial tissue, we're looking at simple squamous epithelium. This is a very thin, flat tissue covering and lining organs, such as the blood vessels, the alveoli, the respiratory membrane within the lungs, where gas exchange takes place, and also forms the membranes of the peritoneum, and the other serous membranes like the pericardium. It's very thin, very flat, which aids it well in transport mechanisms, such as diffusion of gases and ions, osmosis of water across the membrane, as well as secretion and filtration. And the cells themselves, again, very thin and flat, not very distinct, appearing more like a bold line here lining the Bowman's capsule. But we can occasionally see, as shown by these blue arrows, some of the nuclei that bulge up and out from the cell membrane, almost like the plump meat and cheese stuffing in a ravioli. Our next epithelial tissue is simple columnar epithelium. And it's simple as one layer of cells. And this is non ciliated columnar. There's no cilia at the top. Those are microvilli that are membrane like fingers, microscopic structures to aid in absorption and secretion. But the columnar cells are very long, much longer than they are wider, column like, rectangular like. And they typically have a large nucleus that's found commonly near the base of the cell. We can find simple columnar epithelium lining the entire GI tract from the stomach through the intestines, where it's functioning in absorption of nutrients and secretion of digestive enzymes. We can also find it forming the ducts of various glands within the body. Our next tissue is simple cuboidal epithelium. It's simple one layer of cuboidal cells, in this case wrapped to form a tube. The cells themselves, cuboidal, now they're not boxes, they're not cubes per se, but they're very short and kind of squarish. They're kind of like pegs, but they're more short and squat than they are long narrow like the columnar cells. They share the same function as the columnar epithelial cells in secretion and absorption. And location-wise, as we see here, they're commonly found within ducts as in the ducts of the kidney tubules. They're also found in ducts that are leading away from other glands, such as the pancreas, and they're also found in some cases as a secretory layer, producing hormones glands in the thyroid glands. Our next epithelial tissue is pseudostratified columnar epithelium. And this is a single layer of columnar epithelial cells. Now it looks like it's stratified. It looks like all these nuclei of different cells are found in many layers stacked one on top of the other. 
but they're not. In actuality, all of the cells make contact with this basement membrane found below the epithelium. So we see columnar cells looking like the simple columnar epithelium, very long, column-like. We have these tufts of cilia found at the surface. And location-wise, we typically see this tissue lining the respiratory tract. We see it courtesy of the cilia functioning in filtering of debris, as well as generating mucus and a secretion that helps to catch all that debris and cilia sweep it up out of the respiratory tract before it damages the more delicate gas exchange membranes below. Finishing up the epithelial tissue, let's begin with stratified squamous epithelium. Now we know simple epithelial tissue is one cell diameter. Stratified epithelium is many layers thick. Strata means layers. And we see the very flat layers of our squamous epithelial tissue covering surfaces, lining the interior of cavities. We see this as a very strong physical protecting epithelial tissue where it's found lining the entire inner mouth, the oral cavity, tongue, the pharynx, and the food tube, the esophagus, all the physical friction of food moving through would damage, uh, irritate very thin epithelial lines, but not so with the stratified tissue. We also find stratified squamous epithelium on the epidermis of the skin, the outermost covering of the skin, providing tremendous physical protection. Here's another view of stratified squamous epithelium, but in this case found in thick skin, such as the palms of the hand and the soles of the feet, where we have many, many more layers of stratified squamous tissue offering even more tougher protection against friction. The next epithelial tissue is transitional epithelium. And when you look at this tissue, it doesn't really have any one distinct shape like the others have. It sometimes looks when it's stretched out like squamous tissue. And when it's more relaxed, like we see here, it resembles more cuboidal cells. See the nucleus, some kind of roundish cell. But the cell shape is very transitional in form because of the function of this tissue. It's a very elastic tissue. It's lining the urinary bladder and portions of the urinary tract where it can distend, which means it can stretch out. And as the bladder fills up with urine, it can accommodate large volumes of fluid. And then after urination, the bladder is empty and the tissue can recoil back to its original shape. So the transitional nature suits this tissue shape really well. So when you look at these layers, if there's that clear layer like you see in the stratified squamous tissue, that these round cells, like, like bubbly bubble wrap cells, are kind of all just piled together haphazardly. And that's important for the flexibility of this tissue as it distends and stretches out. And that wraps it up for our epithelial tissue. The next screencast will feature the connective tissue. Thanks for watching. I hope this is helping you review and learn histology on connective tissue, primarily the loose connective tissues. And the first one that you're looking at here is areola connective tissue. And the search image is fabric. It's almost like we're looking at a small piece of clothing underneath the microscope. We have these thick pink stain collagen proteins crisscrossing, interwoven together to provide tremendous strength and support that the areola connective tissue is known for. 
there's also some reticular fibers. These branch, that's what re reticular refers to, a branching spiderweb-like appearance where this network of proteins helps hold these diverse protein fibers and the fibroblast cells and macrophages and other cells together within this whole environment. The white area is a semi-solid matrix, which is a round substance that kind of binds all this material together. So occasionally you have some elastic fibers. And you see here some of these proteins that sometimes are like coils and the elastic fibers provide the ability to distend, to stretch, as well as to retract and return back to the tissue's original shape. So it provides a lot of strong durability to this tissue. And we find it abundantly through the body. It's found uh, surrounding vessels, surrounding organs, uh, found within the body wall of organs in various layers. It's found within the skin, between the epidermis and the dermis, as well as from the dermis to the subcutaneous layer, helping to bind the adipose fat and the nerves and the sensory receptors of the skin and blood vessels together, acting as a passageway as well uh, from the skin to the rest of the body. Our next loose connective tissue is adipose tissue, and it's made up of these bubble-like adipocytes. These are the fat cells, and they're storing triglyceride fat within their interior, and they can swell and swell to large sizes to accommodate increasing amounts of lipid, and they, they act as a major energy storage depot that uh, can build up fat supplies, but also release them to the body as needed. Adipose is an insulator. It, it surrounds many organs, such as uh, the heart. It's found in the sub-Q layer underneath the skin, helping to maintain body temperature. Tremendous cushion and support as well, because it's a prominent tissue in many of the joints, helping to cushion from the hard impact of, of movement. The general appearance of the tissue is very open and porous, almost spongy. These very thin membranes of the adipose tissue uh, don't give a whole lot of strength, but the main thing here is room surface area to hold a lot of triglyceride fat. We can find it as well within bone. There's a region of the bone called the yellow bone marrow that provides an energy supply. Our final loose connective tissue is reticular connective tissue. And the search image here is roots, almost as if you're looking at soil and plant roots under the microscope where remember reticular means branching and these dark black or brown fibers are the tissue uh, that provides tremendous support and structure to organs like the lymph nodes. It's also found in the liver, the red bone marrow, and the spleen. It provides a lot of room, a lot of surface area to hold the blood cells uh, in, those, in those organs, to hold the white blood cells in the lymph nodes to help purify and filter the tissue fluid as it passes through. And let's focus on dense connective tissue. This is dense regular connective tissue. First thing you should ask when you see this under the microscope, where's the cells? Well, we can see the nuclei of our fibroblasts kind of squeezed in between what very little space there is between these dense collagen bundles. Remember, this is dense connective tissue, so there is not a whole lot of room. It's the direction of the collagen protein bundles. We're running in the same parallel direction. We're not crisscrossing. We're not overlapping. We're running parallel. That's what regular is referring to in the terminology. So you're not seeing cell membranes, like smooth muscle 
for some looks kind of like this, but you're not seeing individual long, skinny, tapered, needle-like cells like you do in smooth muscle. Our next dense tissue is dense irregular connective tissue. So it's dense. Where's the white space? Don't see a whole lot of it around here. Where are the cells? Well, there's, there's some stained, but there's not a whole lot of cells here to look at, similar to dense regular connective tissue. Instead, we see an abundance of tightly packed collagen bundles. But here, the bundles are moving in all directions. That's where the word irregular comes from in our terminology, in irregular, diverse directions. So this tissue is interwoven together, these tough bundles of collagen fibers. So strength is a huge function of this tissue. We find it commonly wrapping around organs like the muscle. Uh, it's found as well within the skin and the thick dermis of the skin. It's also found as protective coverings around cartilage and uh, bone and the perichondrium and periosteum respectively. And it plays a role in joints as well, playing a supporting uh, function in the joint capsule. So strength and support are huge benefits of having a lot of this dense regular tissue around the body. Our last dense connective tissue is elastic connective tissue. And the search image to look for are these springy coils that we can see scattered around in these various bundles. They're wavy, some are kind of corkscrew shape. A spiral appearance is a definite search image you want to look for. And they're running parallel to each other. You don't see them overlapping. They're all running in the same direction here within these bands. And like its name suggests, elastic connective tissue provides elasticity, which means the tissue can extend out to accommodate a larger volume and it can retract back to the original shape. So it helps maintain the shape of organs like blood vessels, for example. The elastic arteries have to regulate blood pressure with the help of this elastic connective tissue. It's also in the lung and the airways to accommodate respirate on connective tissue, and we're going to focus on cartilage. This is hyaline cartilage. And like other connective tissues, we see cells embedded within a matrix or ground substance that includes some acellular components like protein and water, salts, acids, etc. And hyaline cartilage being the main joint cartilage to offer protection, support, cushioning, lubrication, providing a, a very friction-free surface for the ends of the lung bones to move against in the joint. This cartilage has a thicker jelly-like matrix. And that's the bluish, whitish regions here where we see the chondrocytes in the reddish stain scattered pretty evenly. It's an even distribution of chondrocyte cells to matrix. That's one of the key features to look for when you're deciding what type of cartilage you have. It is the quantity of matrix relative to the distribution of the chondrocyte cells. And you notice the cells are found in little chambers. You see some of the white spaces. Those little chambers, they're kind of like little mini Swiss cheese holes or kind of like the, the pores of a sponge. 
those chambers holding the cells are called lacunae. And they're little pockets within this jelly-like matrix where the cells can survive and, and thrive and carry out some maintenance of this tissue. And we find hyaline cartilage as the major joint cartilage on the ends of the long bones, as well as around the trachea and the larynx, the voice box, in addition to the embryonic and fetal skeletons. This cartilage is fibrocartilage. And this is one of the extremes. If hyaline is kind of the middle of the road, average cartilage, this is one of the extremes. What we see here is a very far dispersed set of chondrocytes where the cartilage cells have a lot of space between them. They have a lot of matrix between them. That's one of the big search images to look for. There in their lacunae, we can see some of the white regions there that are helping to support the chondrocyte cells. But look at the matrix, it's very dense. It, it almost looks like dense irregular connective tissue in a way, but that tissue does not have these larger chondrocytes and these very prominent lacunae spaces. Remember, we couldn't see a whole lot of cellular detail at all in the dense irregular connective tissue. But you can see the fibers, how kind of stringy, especially here where it's a little lighter, how stringy and fibrous this cartilage is. And this is tough. If we're looking at gel as a uh, matrix for the hyaline, this is more like hardened rubber, like in a hockey puck or in a car tire. It's really tough and strong, able to endure lots of stress and strain. This is the primary cartilage in between the vertebrae, forming the vertebral discs, as well as the pubic synthesis, the pad of fibrocartilage between the pubic bone. And this is our final cartilage. This is elastic cartilage. Notice the matrix chondrocyte ratio. We don't have much matrix here at all. It's very thin. The lacunae are very close together. The large chondrocyte cells within them are just crammed together. Very little matrix. This is the other extreme from the fibrocartilage. This is found in the larynx, uh, forming the epiglottis covering the uh, superior portion of the voice box, as well as the outer ear. It's very thin, provides support, and maintains the shape of structures. In this podcast, I'm going to review muscle tissue histology, including skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscle. First muscle tissue is skeletal muscle. This muscle tissue carries out voluntary muscle contraction, which means that it's under conscious control, which functions in movement, helps maintain posture and balance, protection, as well as feet reduction from its contraction. Skeletal muscle is found in all of the major muscles of the body where it's attached to the bones of the skeleton by tendons. The long red cells that are drawn represent the long muscle cells, also called the muscle fibers. One search image to keep in mind is that the muscle fibers are all parallel to each other, which means they're all running in the same direction. These long tube-like cells also contain alternating light dark bands called striations, and I'm drawing these now in each of the muscle fibers. These striations represent the dense concentrations of proteins, including actin and myosin, that allow muscle tissue to contract, as well as other proteins that help support the tissue. A unique trait of skeletal muscle tissue is the presence of multiple nuclei per cell. I'm drawing these now in each of the fibers. And one search image to keep in mind is their location at the peripheral edge of the cell membrane that can be found either at the top or the bottom throughout the muscle fiber. Here's a micrograph of skeletal muscle tissue, and you can see the parallel fibers, the dense concentration of striations, and the peripheral nuclei.
on the next tissue is cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle tissue is only located in the heart wall. It carries out involuntary contraction, which is not under conscious control. And it's helping to pump blood throughout the entire body through blood vessels. Like skeletal muscle tissue, cardiac muscle consists of two blank cells called fibers, but rather than arranged parallel to each other, they're found in a branching or forking pattern. Another difference from skeletal muscle tissue is the presence of one nucleus per cardiac muscle fiber. And these nuclei are oval or rounded in shape and generally are located in the center of the fiber. Like skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle tissue is also striated. And I'm drawing the fine striated lines representing those muscle proteins throughout the fibers. In this photo of cardiac muscle tissue, you can see the branching nature of the fibers, the presence of striations, as well as the central location of the nuclei, which is the fibers. A unique feature of cardiac muscle tissue is that the fibers are connected to each other by thick cellular junctions called intercalated discs. I'm drawing them here as darker, bolder bands compared to the rest of the striations. These intercellular connections are similar to how two jigsaw puzzle pieces are joined together. These cellular joints make cardiac muscle very strong and they hold the fibers strongly together during their intense contractions. In this micrograph of cardiac muscle, you can see the dark, bold, vertical lines indicating the intercalated discs. Our final muscle tissue is smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is involuntary muscle, which, like cardiac muscle, is not under conscious control. Smooth muscle is found in sheets where the skinny individual smooth muscle cells are stacked on top of each other. Each individual cell is tapered at the ends and thicker in the middle where the nucleus is found. It's similar to a stretched out ravioli in appearance. The cells are arranged in a staggered pattern similar to the arrangement of bricks in a wall. Smooth muscle is found in the walls of the hollow organs like the stomach and the intestines, as well as the walls of the artery and bladder, airways like the trachea, the gallbladder, the uterus, and the muscles in the iris and ciliary body of the eye. Smooth muscle tissue functions in movement, such as constriction of the blood vessels and the airways, moving food through the digestive tract, or contraction of the urinary bladder and the gallbladder. Another big difference compared to skeletal and cardiac muscles is the lack of striations in these individual smooth muscle cells. The smooth name of the tissue is from the lack of these protein bands. In this micrograph of smooth muscle tissue, you can see the stacked, staggered layering of these individual cells. You can observe the skinny appearance of these cells, how they are running parallel to each other in these dense bands. Another characteristic of smooth muscle tissue is the appearance of one nucleus per cell. Under the microscope, the nuclei often appear stretched out, almost cigar-shaped. And that concludes our tour of muscle tissue histology. I hope this podcast has helped you in your understanding of muscle tissue. And good luck on your lab practicals and exams. Here's a bit on nervous tissue.
The system is a network of specialized cells that monitors the internal and external environment, processes information, and initiates commands through which the body reacts. This tissue is composed of two types of cells, neurons or nerve cells and glial cells. The neuron, the basic functional unit of the nervous system, is specialized to conduct electrical impulses. Neurons have several important functional properties, a high metabolic rate, most are incapable of cell division, and they typically function throughout life. The size and shape of neurons is variable, but they share basic features. The cell body, or soma, receives, integrates, and sends nerve impulses. It typically contains a large nucleus that often has a prominent nucleolus. Ribosomes are abundant and form clusters known as chromatophilic substance, or nissel bodies that stain darkly with basic histological dyes. Types of processes project from the cell body, axons and dendrites. Axons direct information away from the cell body. Most neurons have a single, long, thin axon connected to the cell body at a region known as the axon hillock. The axon generally does not branch, but it may have occasional side branches called collaterals. Most axons terminate as multiple fine branches called telodendria. These have distal expansions known as synaptic knobs, also called end bulbs or terminal boutons. Rites direct information toward the cell body. They are relatively short, tapered processes that branch along their length. They often possess small, irregular projections called dendritic spines where axons can synapse. A synapse is where information is transferred between nerve cells or to an effector cell or to a sensory receptor cell. Cells, which are also known as neuroglia, are support cells that represent about 60% of cells in the nervous system. Types of glial cells are found in the central nervous system, or CNS. Astrocytes, ependymal cells, microglia, and oligodendrocytes. Two additional types of glial cells are found in the peripheral nervous system, or PNS, Schwann cells, and satellite cells. Astrocytes are the most abundant type of glial cell in the CNS. They are star-shaped, with numerous branching processes whose expanded ends contact and support neurons. In some astrocytes, these processes contact capillaries as paravascular feet that help form a blood-brain barrier. This regulates the passage of substances between the CNS and bloodstream. Important astrocyte functions include regulation of the chemical environment and promotion of neuronal development. Unlike neurons, astrocytes are capable of cell division and can replace dying neurons with a glial scar. Endomal cells are epithelial cells that line the ventricles of the brain and central canal of the spinal cord. They play an important role in the production and circulation of cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. Microglia are small, elongated cells that have short, irregular processes. Their main function is to respond to infection in the CNS. When activated, they become phagocytic and remove cellular debris associated with damaged nervous tissue. They also secrete immunoregulatory substances, such as cytokines, as part of this response. Oligodendrocytes have large cell bodies with thin, flat processes that wrap repeatedly around portions of axons in the CNS. This wrapping process produces an insulating cover known as a myelin sheath. The oligodendrocyte can myelinate multiple axons. However, each axon requires multiple oligodendrocytes for complete myelination. Two additional types of glial cells are found only in the PNS, Schwann cells and satellite cells. 
Schwann cells, also known as neurolemocytes, myelinate PNS axons. Each Schwann cell forms a myelin sheath around a single axon, unlike oligodendrocytes in the CNS that can myelinate multiple axons. As with oligodendrocytes, multiple Schwann cells are required to myelinate each axon. Myelinate cells are small and flat. They provide physical and chemical support for neurons located in ganglia. Okay, that actually brings to a close what I have to discuss. Does anybody have any questions before we bump out? We're gonna do chapter five on, uh, on uh, let's see. Okay. Yes, I, I have a question. Um, I came in on the tail end. Yeah. You were saying something about you had moved the dates out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you check the I, calendar, I, the assignments uh -huh. have been have been set up so that um, none of them are going to be late. Right, your first due okay. date is the thirteenth. Okay. Okay. So you'll be and then we're in lab tomorrow, correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay. In lab tomorrow, and then um, on Thursday we'll pick up with chapter five. Chapter five. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right, and uh, I should have a syllabus up um, by tomorrow for lecture and for lab so that you know exactly what's happening when. Okay. All right. Well, thank Any you. other questions before we go? I do have one more question. Yeah. When, um, <laughs> when will the videos be posted for like, just, like, just so we can go back and rewatch? Okay, for this one, um, it's gonna be posted tonight. Mm -hmm. It has to, uh, it has to um, record, compress, and I have to put the link up. All the other videos are available um, up through chapter three as podcasts, and I sent those to you in your email. So you okay, those, the, yeah, those, those are already available. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All Anything right, else? Thank you. Anything okay. else? We good? All right. Well, good. I thank you all for coming, and I will see you all tomorrow night. Okay? okay. Thank you. Good night. Good night.